Hi everyone, welcome back to Dragonfly Engineering. So this week we're going to continue on the mold making process where we left off last week with the start of the EDM electrode machining. Alright, so let's face off the top of this copper so we get a nice reference top. So now we'll machine the profile of our pin into the tip of this piece of copper. We also have to add in the spark gap because the EDM machine uses electric sparks to eat away the steel pin, but there, there needs to be a gap for the spark to exist. I think in our case it's going to be four thousandths of an inch or a hundred microns. Okay, we got the program set, so I am going to set this forty thousandths end mill to the top of our electrode. Okay, so I set the tool height there, so now I'm going to move up 100 microns, and then reset. And that's for this, so the spark doesn't interfere with the sidewalls of the pin. And we are ready, so I'm going to get the program loaded and we will start cutting our little profile into our electrode for the EDM machine. Start and motion hold ready. Okay, there we go. It should take, I think, uh, 15 minutes to cut this. Alright, so we're done with our electrode here, so now we will unlock the spindle, and I still need to figure out how to, <laughs> I'm going to have to change this clamp here, but let's basically release the pull stud on our stock here, that should be enough, and pull our electrode out. Okay, so we're over on the EDM machine now. And I've made a temporary setup here, so I've got this small tooler's vise, and our pin is basically sticking out of a, a little a V notch in the uh, in the jaw of the vise. And I got a scrap piece of aluminum tubing here, which I use to machine out shapes, which is a real convenient way to cut out thin sheet metal shapes if you get a, a square tube. That way you can fixture the sheet metal easier. But that's a different story. Anyway, so I've clamped this vise down to the aluminum stock here which I've strap clamped onto the ceramic table of the uh, EDM machine. This, this table right here, this brown stuff. And since the ceramic table is an insulator, but the EDM machine machines with electricity, I had to put a supplemental ground strap uh, from, the, from the side of the vise over to the main ground uh, for the main mag vise in the back. I have a different project here, which I had to cover up for a different customer. Uh, so I've got a couple of work coordinates set up on this. So the, our new work coordinate system is our pin that we're going to machine now. So here's our electrode and we're going to load the electrode into the spindle. This has got the same 3R combi chuck mount that uh, was on the vise on the mill. So this guy will just load it right into the exact position of this chuck as it was on the mill over there. So let me get this guy into the tool changed position. To do that, excuse me, I'm going to reach under. I've got this, this, this uh, control pendant. So we are going to move Z up and go a little faster. And then to change out the tool, I need to uh, tell the, the EDM machine to go into the tool changed position. So I am going to go around the camera here and hit that button. And what it's going to do is it's going to figure out its exact position to change a tool. It's not really important for one-off tools, but if a tool changer is used, which is these like tines over here, you know, you can hang a tool off of these like so, then it needs to know its position angles and a little better. Okay, so we're at the tool change position. So I am going to, this is actually a two-handed operation. 
So hold on to the tool. I might have to reach across the camera, but I'm going to hit acknowledge and unclamp. And I pulled that tool out. This is the probe tool that I use to find the exact center of this pin. I'm going to set this guy over here. We're going to and then we are going to load our, our little EDM tool in, and I'm going to hit clamp. Okay, there we go. So now our tool is in there. I like to make sure it's in there by pulling on it to make sure it won't fall out. And now all we have to do is to set the Z height, because I've already set the X and Y location. So to set the Z height, I'm basically just going to travel the, the electrode down and hopefully we have enough travel. And then as I get closer, I'm going to slow it down. I'm also going to move off axis a little bit because we're interested in the flat of our electrode. So we're going to come down, and I'm basically just waiting for an electrical circuit to close, and then it'll beep and say, you've touched. Just like that. OK, now I'm going to set the Z0. And I previously set the X and Y zero, so we should be ready to EDM cut the profile into our pin that we machined on the mill using electric spark milling. So the copper will shoot electric sparks onto the steel and erode away the steel. Now the copper does not really erode away. Okay, so I wrote the program. It's a real simple program. Basically told it to burn down onto the pin uh, 4.2 millimeters deep with a 100 micron spark gap. So the, the tool is gonna come down and just plunge right in and burn off all the steel down to the shape of the pin that we want, plus 100 microns. And then it's going to roll around a little bit like this and clean up the sidewalls. And the tool will go down to the beginning position and then the wall around the work area will rise up, which is what's happening right now. Make sure I got clearance everywhere. And then we will fill the area with oil. My wall may be a little too high. <laughs> I, may have, I may have too much oil in there, but we'll see what happens. Ah, that's not too bad. You may not be able to see much. Okay, so if you look in there, you can see the just the top edge of our electrode basically milling away or, or hopping up and down and electro sparking the, the little pin, which you know you can see right there. And we're not going to see much because this is a very small machining operation, so we're not going to see the big sparks and the smoke coming off. But rest assured, this electrode is slowly eroding away the, that pin and the spindle hops up and down to flush out the burned steel in the gap between the copper and the steel. So it, it hops up and it sucks in fresh fluid and then hops down and pushes out the, the old fluid or the, the kind of charred fluid and the, some of the particulate. So it's a self-flushing operation. You can see a little bit of uh, smoke whisking up out of the oil back here and a little bit right there. All right, while well, the EDM machine is cutting the profiles into the pins for the, sn for the snouts at the top, I'm gonna go ahead and drill and ream the ejector pin holes and the pin holes for the snouts, which are also gonna be ejector pins. So I've set the drill bits in the drill center and we will drill two 1 16th ejector pins in the front and the three 109 thousandths um, core pins in the back and drill center all the holes. So let's go ahead and do that. So I cut the first uh, test pin here, and this is the profile that we machined into the copper electrode. But I have a concentricity problem. The, the center of this EDM feature is not concentric to the pin, which it needs to be. 
So I'm going to switch tactics and I'm actually going to machine a round pocket into the tip of the EDM tool or the EDM electrode and then actually remachine this profile in the bottom of that round pocket. That way we can use the EDM electrode itself as a touch off tool to find the exact center of this shaft uh, using the cutting or the, the electrode itself as opposed to the ball tip probe that I was using. So that way we should have a much more accurate alignment on the tip of this pin because it could be leading off in weird directions from where we measured it. So we'll take a look at it under the microscope. But I'm mostly just interested in concentricity. So looking at these pins under the microscope, you can see that the surface finish looks pretty good on them and the concentricity looks really good. So by adding that alignment ring to the electrode as opposed to using a separate tool to align the, uh, the electrode shape to the pin, we wound up with a much better concentricity. So I think I'm gonna use that trick in the future. So I flipped the B side of the mold over and now we're going to drill and tap the mounting holes for the riser blocks in the base plate. And then after that we're going to drill the clearance holes for the ejector pins for the features in the back of the mold. So let's go ahead and fire this thing up. I've already set the tool heights. Got to use coolant though. All right, so I'm over here on the Haas mill and I've stacked up the two ejector plates and I've actually started drilling. So I've drilled all the holes for the ejector pins to fit through, as well as the starts for the threaded screw holes that will hold these two plates together. So you can see I've got both fixtured in this vise and I'm about to drill the clearance hole for the uh, corner screws. And then the next operation is gonna be to tap the four or the six screw holes that will hold these two plates together. So I'm basically combining machining of both plates into one operation by clamping the two together. All right, so we're over on the Herco and I started cutting here. So I've got a quarter inch ball end mill and the uh, spindle now. And what I'm doing is I'm basically just machining in the, the runner path. And this is just manual. I'm not getting scientific or anything with it. All right, so got a 16th inch tapered end mill loaded in the spindle. We're gonna use this tool to break into the mold cavity itself. Now we're still 100 microns above our final height, but some of this is kind of a experience, see what it looks like type of situation. All right, so in this operation, we're gonna machine both of the pilot holes, or as well, the bearing holes. These are gonna be 7 8 diameter or 22 millimeters in diameter and these are the sleeve bearings that will guide the ejector plate up and down. So basically it's going to be a 7 8 hole that goes through both plates. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that.
All right, let's see how this fits. Oh yeah, that, that fits pretty good. Uh, I think I still need to clear out the top because I think this half inch end mill is a little dull, so I'm sure I had some flex in the cut. So I bet the bottom hole is tighter. So I'm just gonna do a, probably a 1,000th clearance cut just on the top plate. Keep in mind there's both plates are clipped together here. So let's do that and I'll be right back. All right, so here we're cutting the, the extra clearance for the bushing, the uh, linear plane bearing, uh, bearing for the ejector plate system. So this is the clearance hole on the top plate so that uh, I'll wind up pressing the bearing into the bottom plate. And then when I assemble the ejector plate, the, the top plate won't fight me by jamming up uh, when we're at the assembly stage, hopefully. <laughs> I'm trying not to mill into my uh, clamps as much as I used to. <laughs> so now I mill into my vice grips instead. <laughs> All right, let's pull this guy out. So here is the first plate. It's best to have the, the plate that's threaded be against the back of the mold so that you can, so you can work on the back of the mold. So what we'll wind up doing is taking this plate off, you know, and, and swapping out pins if need be when you're servicing the mold. That way you're not trying to get up under and uh, getting to a screw head that's deep inside of the mold. If the screw head is just sticking out the back, then you can just unscrew this plate with it still kind of integrated into the mold itself. So you don't have to pull all the pins out, which can be a hassle. So we are going to put the half 13 threaded hole in this plate, which has the clearance holes for the, the screws that screw the two plates together. We are going to drill and tap the half 13 drive hole in the bottom ejector plate. Get some coolant. I'm gonna double check the vise because this is gonna be a little bit of a heavy cut. And cycle start. This is 800 RPM and four inches per minute or 100 millimeters per minute. The bigger the drill bit, the lower the RPM you want to run it at. <laughs> I probably could have gone lower because I got bird nest going on. And this is 200 RPM, I believe. And this is rigid tapping so the mill synchronizes the spiral of the tap with its z-axis travel which is real handy saves your wrists <laughs> okay i think we're done okay here we are back on the bench so the next step here is to finish polishing our mold cavities and this mold cavity was machined on the the haas tm1 mill which is about a 20 year old mill and it's like a it's not it's not as advanced as the uh, the newer Herco mills regarding the 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 ways and everything, so you can kind of see a plaid pattern. Uh, I did do I think two directions on this machining operation. Did I? No, I think I just went back and forth. But you can kind of see it's difficult to see, but you can you can almost make out like the the shape of the bearings or the the rails on the mill itself. There's like a periodic line that goes this way. It's kind of recording the, or mapping the, the bearings and the rails of the mill itself. I don't know if you can see it here, but yeah, you can kind of see a repeated pattern this direction, even though the mill was actually cutting this way, if this, you know, this Q-tip was the mill, we were, we were cutting this direction, but you can kind of see probably like original, like micro grind marks from the bearing itself or the the rails on the on the mill. But anyway, we are going to look at polishing that out with some of this metal polish. Now let me zoom out so I can show you what this stuff is. It's an old container that I have, but here's whatever this is. Ioso metal polish, but I, I buy this on McMaster car and this is that cerium oxide I was talking about uh, the other day when we were polishing the other mold. So what I'm gonna do is get a little bit on this cerium oxide slurry onto this Q 
Q-tip and then we'll zoom back in on our mold surface. All right, and basically I've, I've washed this mold down with soap and water in the sink over there. And now what we're gonna do is basically just rub this cerium oxide metal polish onto the mold cavity surface with a Q-tip, basically just, you know, cotton. Try not to use paper towel, even though I think I did that the other day. Um, but like cotton cloth or just cotton balls is good. And we'll go back and forth. I'm kind of deforming my Q-tip. <laughs> yeah, I guess my fingers will wind up being the support for the Q-tip. And I'm polishing perpendicular to the travel of the raster cut. You know, the end mill is going, basically doing this, this operation, but the other axis. And we'll see if we get the same kind of mirror finish. I think we will, because this polish, well, well, one thing, the, the, the machine surface, even though it's flat, looks is deceptive because of the surface finish that the end mill creates. It's actually very flat and almost mirror-like, but deceptive. So when you come along with some polishing compound and kind of break the swirl off, then you start to see the true flatness and quality of the surface. You can probably hear the Q-tip riding over some raster cuts. So I don't know how well this surface will look, but let's let's see what we got. Uh, do I have alcohol? I actually brought in some denatured alcohol I found in my garage. So I'm going to go the other direction now. All right. So we'll start to see what our finish looks like. Or I can use this box. See what that reflection looks like. Yeah, it's pretty good. All right, so I'm gonna get some soap and water and or alcohol and clean this off and we'll see what we got. I'll be right back. All right, so this is what our finish is looking like on the little square itself. See a reflection. I got a fresh Q-tip here. And the thing with polishing and precision parts is you don't want to over polish because you start to mute the sharpness of, of the cavity that you machined. So try not to overdo polishing. And reflected metal is a little less forgiving than transparent plastic can be, but still, people scrutinize it, they're gonna find, you know, something, of course, always. <laughs> Actually, one, one final thought is when the plastic starts filling this mold, it will actually polish the mold surfaces as well. So the, the best polish you get from, from the polishing and mold making aspect only gets better after maybe 100 parts uh, have, have run through this mold. Uh, you get uh, just a more shinier, flatter surface which also means that your mold is wearing out. So uh, some plastics can kind of wear out your mold just by continually polishing and, and, and dulling off the sharp edges. So anyway, all right, now it's time to assemble all these mold parts and get the mold loaded on the molding machine. So we're going to assemble our ejector plate first. Need a couple of these bearing rods that we're gonna stick into the mold here. I went ahead and drilled through and with a, with a counter bore for a, a quarter 20 screw after I had to machine out of pocket for this plate to fit in because our, our pins weren't you know, long enough to go all the way through. So these have a thread in them. 
So what we're going to do is go ahead and hammer this pin in. I'm going to get a rubber mallet and a square. This one, two, three block may be sufficient. Actually, I can get two of them. And these blocks are basically just to make sure that the part goes in or starts square. There we go. Originally, this is just going to be hammered in, but with the reduced press fit, now we are looking at having to screw it in from the other side just so it doesn't come out on us, which is all right, too. I mean, not coming out, but screwing it in. My old brass hammer, it's probably 60 years old. Okay. You know, I may not even need to screw those in. It feels pretty robust. But let's see how, how we're looking. Probably need a longer screw, actually. All right, well, we'll revisit that. Okay, so the half 13 thread is the back portion and that's what the molding machine pushes this ejector plate with. So what we're going to do is figure out which one of these is the tighter fit. That feels like a clearance. One of these I machined a bigger clearance hole and that's more of the press fit. So we'll square this up as well. Because you can press these bearings in crooked. They'll just start digging into the side of your wall. So I just double check in square here on both axes. Looks good. We got a reasonably light press fit. And I've reused these. You can see some of the press out from the last mold that I recycled. Now this has the threaded holes and this plate will go on like this. And then we'll thread a screw through all of this and basically pinch all these ejector pins in that gap right there. I could probably oil this and it would come out easier. There we go. Okay, so. Now we want to place our ejector pins. So basically these are the three pins that have the EDM tip on the end. And I'm going to drop those guys into these three holes. I measured that they're all the same length. Here's the other one. And then we got two ejector pins and I and I checked the model and these pins need to be 0.4 millimeters longer than these pins. Actually that's the other way around. These should be 0.4 less. I should probably double check that. I'll be right back. All right I'm back. So yeah I had the offset wrong. <laughs> so now we are set. So the, the pins need to be 0.4 millimeters shorter than this pin not longer. And these are the two 16th ejector pins that exist uh, at the back of the of the part down here. So, okay. So, oh, I see that I need to drill this hole out too. Eesh, all these little details. All right, I need to drill out the three sixteenths ejector pinhole. So I'll meet you over at the drill press. All right. So let's switch out the old drill bit here. This is slightly bigger than three sixteenths. Because ejector pins, usually you want them to float and find their position. And here we go. I'm going to flip this over so it's keyed on this board. All right, and then we'll just drill this guy out. I did a pilot hole in the CNC mill, so. Then we got our 316 sprue ejector pin, like so. So that's how we do it. And then we can stick our back on. So I've ground these heads to be the same height. Uh, the 3 16 ejector pin head fits inside of this hole, the uh, half 13 hole. 
So that's that's not a concern. And uh, I could have actually pocketed for these pins, but it's it's probably not really required. For a more production mold, that would have been done, but but this is kind of just a quick prototype. So here we go. So this is our ejector pin or our ejector plate, and this pin comes out. And half the time I forget to put this guy in when I load it in the mold, molding machine that is. So try to rem remind me to do that. <laughs> I'm going to get some 832 screws to screw this guy together. All right, so I don't have a one inch long 832 socket head cap screw that fits in these holes uh, because, it, you know, um, yeah, it's just not long enough. So what I'm going to do is counter bore these, these screw holes with this counter boring tool. And then it basically it's a profile, a square cutting counter bore with a pilot drill in the middle. I think this is for a number 10 screw. I don't have a number eight. So we're just going to go ahead and drill these out for a counter bore. And you basically know you're done on height or at height when, when the little square portion of this drill is flush with the surface of your, of your part. So this way I don't have to run out and buy one inch long screws. I added a little WD-40 to help guide these, this top plate down. And it's slightly warm now, so it probably doesn't want to go. There we go. Okay. So here's our 832 by 3 quarter inch. Any chance this Allen key is right? Nope. Of course not. <laughs> oh, here we go. I'm going to make an Allen key organizer at some point in the future. So I'm just going to get these screws started. I want to tighten the middle ones first since, since we don't have a solid sandwich base in here. We're going to tighten around the ejector pin feet first and then kind of just let the rest follow. So now we are going to fit our ejector plate and string all of our little pins through. I have some oil in my hands, that may be enough. You got to make sure your ejector pins get into the pilot holes of your ejector pin holes in the mold, like so. So let's see if it moves in good. Yeah, it's pretty good. We're finding the, the reamed holes now, so I'm kind of tapping this guy in. There's a step from precision ream to just a clearance hole, and right now we're at that step. But if we gently tap it and convince it to go home, we may actually also want to loosen the, uh, the ejector plate. But let's see what happens here. I'm going to give it a little more. looking down in there to it looks like the pins are starting and if this is a little tight it's not a big deal it just means that it's more accurate <laughs> that's what I like to tell myself okay so you can start to see the pins poking through We got a little more to go. Okay, there is our ejector pin array. Two in the bottom, and then the three formed pins. So that's nice. Now ultimately I'm gonna have to set the height of a of a block on the back of this ejector pin uh, or ejector plate so that the pull back position is correct. So that basically these two pins are flush with the mold surface. But for now, I think, so th this process is a little different. I'm setting the ejector pins such that 
the ejector plate is way forward uh, relative to the base of the mold. And then we're going to set the pin height with a with the spacer. Where in the last episode, we I would uh, take an ejector pin like this and I would set it on the ejector plate and then I'd mark the top and cut it when the plate is fully at the bottom. But in this mold, the plate is basically going to be way up and a big old block of metal is going to set the pin heights. Which I guess we're at that point now. So I'm going to feel how these seat, these riser blocks. And my brother made these for me, by the way. Uh, the base and the riser blocks. He just delivered a new set to me because these, these saved me some time. Otherwise, I got to make these as well. All right, so I think the thing to do now is to basically tap these guys down into the right flush position. And I'll measure this gap and I'll make a spacer block probably two spacer blocks or a spacer two. So I lost the audio on my microphone, the battery died, so I'm gonna do some voiceover. So here I'm measuring the heights of the pins to figure out the height of the spacer that will set the ejector plate. And then here's the uh, aluminum tube that I'm loading into the lathe to machine to the right height. It's basically just a large standoff. And this spacer is pretty simple. It's just loaded into the three jaw chuck and I'm just gonna face the the front off of it and then I think I even used the existing center from the previous whatever it was made from. Here's a, a 9 16 drill that I'm basically just drilling all the way through this aluminum spacer and then the final operation is after I drill this hole I'll flip the part around in the chuck and then just face the back to a specific height which I did some of that off camera there's no need to fuss about caliper measurements. So now we're back on the bench with the spacer that we made and I'll just deburr it here so that uh, it, you know doesn't create particles while the molding machine is running because the ejector post is going to go through this spacer through the center hole in the bottom of the mold there and the or the post is the actuator so it's a half inch 13 threaded rod. So now what I'm doing is I'm basically just doing the final assembly of the mold. You can see these are the standoff blocks that my brother made and this is going to be the final stack up so you can see the profile here so the ejector plate is going to be stopped and it's traveled by the round spacer that we that we just made on the lathe over there and then we will take the mold half and load it onto the risers and this is the final stack for the b side of the mold and then the a side is in the background there and they'll stack together so now what i need to do is get some half inch bolts to basically flip this mold on its side after everything looks right and feels good and then we will bolt this thing together now this is a prototyping mold so I didn't like do fussy details with dowel pins and things like that uh, but in a more production mold you would dowel pin all of these parts together so then finally the push rod for the ejector system in the molding machine will uh, thread into the back of the ejector plate here and as I recall, uh, the tapping of the half 13 thread in the ejector plate didn't go through all the way. So I'm going to hand chase out those threads uh, with a hand tap here. All right, so I cleaned out the threads there, and now I should be able to screw in the ejector rod. That will actually, again, will actuate the ejector plate back and forth to eject the parts out of the mold. And now what I am going to do is put that center ejector pin in. This is the ejector pin that actually creates the pocket for the sprue to fit in and then ejects the sprue out. And this is, the sprue is the thing that actually pulls the, the, um, the sprue part out of the A side of the mold. Uh, we can talk more about that when we actually mold the parts. Now I'm going to get the screws and bolt this mold together. These are just half inch. I think these are half inch. They may be three eighths inch regular uh, bolts from like Home Depot. Nothing special about them. Then I set up the hand drill to save myself a little time with a ratcheting uh, chuck on it, you know, so it doesn't fling out of my arms when it hits bottom. <laughs> this actually saves a lot of time uh, better than dealing with the hand ratchet. 
And I th think that is it for the B side. I'll just screw the, the stand-in ejector rod out in the middle of the mold there once I tighten things down. And oh, I think what I'll do next is pull the plate, the ejector plate back. Oh, I, I think I already had it back. So yeah, now I'm going to unscrew that, put the mold up on its back. This is the B side again. So I believe the final step now is to set the alignment dowel pins on the B side to register the B and the A side of the mold. Again, that's the two halves of the mold. You can see how I've pointed it out there. And I cut away some of the hammering in of bearings, but here are these, uh, this is the linear plane bearing on the A side that I'm going to hammer in uh, after I give a lead in. It's good to chamfer these, these machined holes so they don't actually cut into the aluminum housing of the bearing. It's uh, And then uh, I'll give it an initial tap, followed up with a squareness check using a one, two, three block. And basically, you know, like normal, when you press these, these aluminum things into aluminum blocks, they can actually lead off and kind of tear themselves its own new path. Uh, they don't actually, they don't necessarily go in completely square. So you need to start it square uh, for the bearing to actually remain square as you press it in. So now I'm getting back to the one inch dowel pins on the B side. And again, I cut away some of this fuss work. And uh, yeah, so the final step is to stick these two dowel pins in and similar process where I'm going to check square with the one, two, three block. And there I've got the rubber mallet. And usually once, once the pin is started a little bit, then it, it'll basically find its way home. But as I recall, those pins were not a very robust press fit. So I'm just hammering it in because I think I was relying on the tool flex at the bottom of the hole. So it actually slipped in the top and then just self-centered. So yeah, that worked out. Okay, so I pressed in the final bearing here on the, on the cart vise over there. And let's see how our two halves fit together. So there's uh, the feature side, it matches the feature side here. And we'll let it drop on. There we go. So there's our mold. We got the spacer in there. You can see our spacer down there in the center. I do need to drill a temperature sensor hole each side. Well, this looks like a good stopping point for this week, given that we just concluded building the mold. Next week, we are going to load the mold into the molding machine and set up the molding parameters and mold first parts. I'd also like to thank the new patrons to the show, as well as existing patrons. And if you would like to contribute to the production of Dragonfly Engineering Show so you can learn more about machining and injection molding and robots and all the other stuff that we get into, then please consider going to patreon.com and Dragonfly Engineering and contributing to the production of this show. Also, if you'd like to check out our website and existing patrons and new patrons, you can check those out in the credits at the end of the show. Thank you for watching. Oh, goodbye.